Okay, so today um, I'm gonna um, obviously share with you um, my experience in utilizing these work in progress um, preprints um, and posting them on BioArchive and what my experience was and sort of what my motivation was first of all, but then also what, what that experience was in getting that feedback and that engagement from a broader scientific community from the one that's sort of immediately around me. Um, so first I want to give some sort of to set, set the stage for the project that we felt was really amenable to this experience. Um, and so I know this figure looks a bit complicated, but basically the inception of this project or basically the discovery that led to this preprint was incredibly serendipitous. Um, so the inception of this project was really studying this gene called SEMP-R. Um, and for reasons that I'm not gonna go into, we had this reason to believe that there were different isoforms or different versions of SEMP-R that were expressed in the cell that may have differential functions. And so because we were interested in this, we took this sort of broader approach to look at all the potential sort of versions of SEMP-R that could be expressed in the cell. And one thing we were interested, what we, we interestingly found is that there was a small 37 amino acid peptide that could be expressed from um, this alternative open reading frame in the mRNA of SEMP-R that also started upstream of the canonical start for the full length canonical protein. And so what we ended up with was these two versions of SEMP-R that we were really interested in. So the full length canonical protein that I had initially started studying, and then this new or newer small 37 amino acid peptide. Um, and so the first step was we wanted to know, you know, do these localize to the same place? Could there be some kind of differential localization or function? And so we took each protein and we tagged them with a fluorescent protein and then imaged them in the cell to see where exactly they localized. And so first I'll show you what the behavior is of the full length SEMPAR protein. Um, and so what I'm showing you here is the DNA of a cell. And then here in this block um, or this panel, I'm showing you um, the GFP signal which is what the localization is of this full length protein. Um, is that this full length protein localizes to these very specific punctuar foci within the nucleus of the cell. Um, and so we, we expect this because we know that this SEMPR protein functions within this broader um, protein complex that localizes to these specific regions of the DNA, um, which are called kinetochores. And so this is very much what we expected. But surprisingly, when we looked at the localization um, of this small 37 amino acid peptide, we saw that it had very distinct, a very distinct localization behavior. Um, and I think what's most obvious here is that, again, if we look at the DNA as sort of a reference to a cell, we see that this GFP signal, which is really showing us where this Altdorf peptide is localizing, um, we see that it actually localizes peripheral to the nucleus. And in this different cell state called mitosis, we see that it forms these puncta that again are um, outside of the DNA itself. And so from this discovery, we were A, really excited and really perplexed because how is it that this sort of small 37 amino acid peptide has such a distinct behavior from this full length protein? And so we of course wanted to follow this up by getting a better sense of where exactly in the cell is this localizing. And so we decided to do was compare the localization of this small peptide to, uh, to markers within the cell to see it, to reference it to other structures within the cell. And so given that, it, that the localization was peripheral to the nucleus, we looked at two structures that we kind of automatically assumed could be where it's localizing to. And so one was the endoplasmic reticulum and the other was the Golgi. And so in this first panel here, what I'm showing you is what the comparison between this GFP tagged Altorf localization versus what the ER looks like in the cell. And so what you see is that there is that they clearly have very different sort of, they, for, they localize to very different structures in the cell. Um, and then when we compared the localization of this small peptide to a reference protein that localized to the Golgi, we saw that this was pretty identical. And so we concluded that this, oops, sorry, this small peptide had this unique localization behavior in that it localized very specifically to um, the Golgi. And so just to provide a little bit of context, I'm gonna go back to this slide, our, the slide, my expertise and really the expertise of all of our lab 
um, isn't studying these SEMP proteins and other proteins that make up the kinetochore. Um, and so the fact that we find that this sperm peptide localizes to this differential structure was very much outside of like our immediate area of expertise. Um, and so we wanted to additionally look at another aspect of this Altorf, and we wanted to see if this peptide could also sort of be used as this um, dynamic marker for the Golgi. And so we performed live cell imaging just to see what the Golgi looked like throughout one cell cycle. And we saw that the Altorf, which is what I'm showing you here in this panel, um, very robustly uh, localizes to this structure throughout the cell cycle. And so at this point, we're really excited, A, that we had discovered this differential behavior in this very small peptide, but we were a little bit sort of hesitant about what was gonna come next, right? So there were two aspects in particular that we were interested. A was how is it that this very small peptide gets to the Golgi? And then two, could this discovery and this small peptide potentially be used as a tool that could be benefit people that are in the field of studying the Golgi? And so that's what really led to this idea of potentially coming up with and posting a preprint um, of this very early work in progress. And so very, this idea was very much the idea of my advisor. Um, and he came up to me and was kind of like, hey, what if we do this? You know, because this project was very, this, the discovery of this peptide was very much a side project. And so it was kind of in that place where either it becomes something that we kind of just shelf and we're like, hey, we saw this thing and that's very cool. Or we kind of try to push it forward and see if we could discover um, additional cool biology with it. And so his idea was rather than sort of reaching out to maybe individual people or seeking individuals who could help us, what if we kind of cast the broadest net possible to be able to engage many scientists that are in different fields that we may not necessarily directly know um, to gain input, input and feedback on what our discovery was. And so my initial reaction was honestly being a little hesitant. And I think actually for me, one of the reasons was what kind of Arache brought up was that this idea of like, okay, this is a very early, you know, observation. Um, and for us to kind of post it as a preprint, um, which my concept, my perception of preprints were very much, they represented this body of work that was, you know, either already submitted to a journal or were very close to being submitted, right? So it's like kind of this way of us seeing, getting an early look at work that's very much, you know, almost finalized. Um, and so in, at the beginning, we had a lot of conversations about what exactly this preprint would be and how we would approach it in a way that we sort of both felt very comfortable. Um, and so we agreed that, you know, we would take the data that we had and we would write this up as if I was writing a paper. Um, but we really wanted to explicitly set it up um, as a work in progress. And so we write, we, we include this sort of in the introduction and in our conclusion where we say, you know, these are very early observations. Um, and we've done, we've worked on this in the, in sort of the, the, the areas that we would know how to look at this um, small peptide, but that we're open to suggestions. And we do explicitly say, you know, any suggestions for the future directions or for potential experiments to follow up this initial finding. Um, and then in addition to this, um, my advisor was very excited about also, or we were both kind of felt that an important part of this was also kind of promoting this early preprint um, because our real hope was that, you know, many people would see this. Um, and so that's kind of where we used both, you know, publishing this on BioArchive as an early preprint, but then also kind of engaging the broader scientific community through um, science Twitter. Um, and so here I'm just kind of showing this a snapshot of what that initial tweet was, and, and Ian Cheeseman is my advisor. Um, and so, right, so then we wrote this up and kind of posted it, and we're kind of just open to see what would happen. Um, and surprisingly, or maybe not so surprisingly, um, it was a big success. Um, and so I think to me, what was most surprising was really how um, different the feedback was and how excited people were in looking and seeing this work. Where for me, you know, it was kind of this like chance discovery where that I thought was very cool, but I wasn't sure what it would come off as, you know, to the broader scientific community. Um, and so importantly, we received feedback through two main channels. So one was obviously people commenting on Twitter and kind of giving us their, their opinions or what their initial thoughts were and after reading the paper. 
Um, but we also had a few people reach out to us through email and that was, and those emails were either them kind of asking, you know, for the reagent to, uh, to see, to be able to use it for themselves. Um, and also, which was kind of the most fun part for me, but um, Harmit Malik, who's a, a professor at um, the University of Washington actually emailed us where he had taken this sequence and kind of taken it upon himself to perform this um, evolutionary analysis of this um, upstream alter of sequence in the SEMPR protein and other primates. And so, you know, from just posting this preprint, I kind of came out from this initial posting with a lot of insight that, you know, I potentially could have gotten, you know, from reading in the literature and maybe meeting individual people. But because this was a side project, it kind of was this perfect blend, you know? Um, so we received input on, you know, potential, poten uh, potential reasons of why this peptide could localize to the Golgi membrane. So a lot of people who are experts in, in, um, in organelle membrane biology, um, people gave us suggestions on, you know, what potential modifications should we look into um, and help us analyze, you know, the protein sequence itself and think through all the potential ways that it could localize. And so from this initial experience, oh, we took that, so we posted the first preprint, we took their suggestions and applied a lot of these recommendations into the project. Um, and another thing we did is that we actually updated this, this uh, preprint. Um, and so in addition to sort of the initial posting, we also posted it uh, two more times, each time with a little more data and a little more advances in what we had seen. And each time kind of asking people to, you know, provide input if they, if they wanted and to kind of look and look at the, the work as itself. Um, and each time the, the feedback was, was really helpful um, in thinking about the data and in thinking of alternative, you know, experiments to be able to do. Um, and so I guess I wanted to highlight just sort of like two aspects of the project that I think for me, really getting this feedback from the broader scientific community kind of is really the reason that we like explore these different avenues. Um, so one of them is that we people were really interested in you know what is this minimal sequence like what exactly what what parts of this amino acid sequence are responsible for this localization, and so given people's advice and also that evolutionary analysis that Harmit so like kindly. Uh, we were able to do very specific types of mutagenesis and identify specific residues that are critical for its localization. And so we identified this, um, this cysteine residue and then actually we're able, we were able to cut this sequence down to about nine amino acids and that is sufficient for localization, which was pretty interesting and exciting for us. Um, and then additionally, they, people provide, gave us input and even kind of pointed our way to different inhibitors or small molecules to use that could help us maybe um, get, get to, to whether, you know, there's additional modifications that could be facilitating the localization of this peptide. Um, and so I won't go into details, but we were, that could just kind of helped us sort of go into that, that path of this. Um, and so finally kind of where the project is now. So after these kind of different iterations of getting feedback from um, people from posting this early preprint, we have sort of moved forward with trying to publish this as an actual article. Um, and also utilized review comments as another way to kind of broadly get, you know, input from people. And um, we're kind of finalizing that paper now. So it'll hopefully be out and done soon. Um, so finally, I kind of wanted to provide just kind of like this overall reflection on what my experience was with um, utilizing this process of, you know, posting early preprints. Um, and I would say that overall, for me, the experience was really incredibly positive. Um, and I would really recommend this to people who have projects that they feel really lend themselves to this process. Um, and I'll just add that, you know, it, the context of all of this experience is that it was in the time of COVID. And I think for me, the way that I think about this is that like this experience was what a successful poster session would have been like, you know, where someone came to my poster, saw the work, was excited, and we could have that conversation. Um, but what was exciting is that it was happening digitally and with people that you know, we probably immediately would not have gotten in contact with. Um, so sort of as my pros, I said that it really allowed us to really cast that broad net, which was our in initial kind of intention for this, right? That we wanted to get feedback from as diverse array of, sci of scientists as possible. Um, I really liked that it opened the discussion up on the findings to a larger audience. Um, and so we got feedback from people who 
would actually use this peptide as a marker, right? And what, what would they need to know in order to actually use it as a marker? And that was really helpful in kind of pushing things forward, um, which is something that like, given that this wasn't my background was very useful to, to learn about. Um, and also, you know, just going through the process of writing up your findings early. Um, there's one thing writing it in your notebook, right? And like kind of keeping that up, but then there's something else in having to kind of put this in the broader context of things and to figure out, you know, if we want to be able to say X, like what do we need to do? Um, and so that was actually really helpful to do this on something that would have been, um, you know, that, that may not have seen the light of day or not have been pushed forward as much if it hadn't been for this kind of um, feedback that we got. And so the opposite of pros are obviously cons, but I couldn't really think of any true cons. So I just kind of thought of like, what are potential concerns or like what people may think about? Um, and I think one of the big things that even it, like my advisor and I will talk about is like, what kind of projects or findings like actually lend themselves to this process, right? Um, where for me, this project was really perfect because it was truly something that like, if I had had time, I would have gone back to, but may have just been kind of buried away in my thesis or in my notebook into something that like I saw, but didn't become anything. Um, but I can definitely see arguments where, you know, maybe other projects are not um, as amenable to this. Um, yeah, I think that's just like an interesting discussion to have there. Um, and again, I, I kind of put this that, um, you know, there is that fear, which Aracha kind of brought up that like posting this early, like, what if I'm wrong about something, you know, what if I do additional things and I realize like, oh, wait, like, this was actually just kind of a fluke, a byproduct of tagging it or something, you know, it's not actually this peptide sequence, um, which I completely understand. But I think that like, for us, you know, we were able to do kind of like this reiterative process of like updating it and being able to say, you know, what have we learned from additional experience experiments and so i think that that's kind of a nice way to like be able to balance that out as well um and i will say um that i can also understand the argument of like oh you know um if you publish this early enough then is it actually novel once you publish it and what what is that like but um i think for me one thing that was very clear too is that you know, when you publish this preprint in progress and even advertising it, you know, on a medium like Twitter, you're still only reaching like a very small population, right, of scientists. And that's people who like actually, a, actually see the tweet, people who are on Twitter and people who will engage. And so I think that there's still kind of this argument to say that, you know, publishing the paper ultimately in a journal is still gonna reach people who hadn't seen the work before. Um, yeah, so that's, that's, those are really kind of my major reflections from this experience. Um, yeah, and with that, I want to say thank you to Rache for inviting me to, to give this talk. Um, and I'm lo really looking forward to kind of hearing what people think and engaging in different conversations. And of course, I want to thank my lab and my advisor, Ian Cheeseman, who was really kind of like the motivator, you know, of this really cool experience that um, you know, really made me like love the science community again, especially after kind of going through that period of time of feeling kind of like, you know, isolated from it. So um, this was overall really great.